we're revisiting one of the most popular episodes in 2025, with Lauren Shalhou, Head of Animal and Grassland Research and Innovation at Chagas Moor Park, who back in June discussed with me the future challenges facing the dairy industry. I think what we must realise now is that we're in a much, you know, the world is constantly changing, you know, maybe three or four years ago or even five or ten years ago, we thought maybe, you know, change, you know, a small thing happening would have a big change. But the the world seems to be in a big flux now, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's pandemic, uh, whether it's economic or whether it's environmental. So all these things are, are, are changing, I suppose. Go back to your point about, um, you know, what has happened. I suppose sometimes we don't do this enough, you know, and and just have a quick look back and see what's happened because we we sometimes get stuck in the, in the moment and are, are too too busy at that. So like, you know, it's it's 15 years now since we probably got the serious signal that milk quotas were going to be removed uh, since the industry started to to expand and and it's 10 years uh, since milk quotas have gone and that 10 years went went very quickly. Uh, what has happened in that period since since that first signal? Um, you know, 15 years ago that milk quotas are going to go, milk output um, up to 22 and probably quite similarly again in 2025 will have increased by very close to 100% in terms of, of milk solids. So that's that's a huge increase, even though, you know, the target at that stage when that policy was being implemented was a 50% increase in, in milk output. So so farmers uh, overachieved that. But that's that's probably not surprising. You know, 31 years of milk quota at that point, uh, there was a huge amount of uh, built up capacity. And I suppose, you know, there's always going to be a reaction when you, you know, hold hold something back for that long. And I suppose that's what we've seen at farm level. Uh, and, and the change in the in the period since milk quotas have gone have, have been amazing, really, or, or very dramatic, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, milk uh, cow numbers increasing by probably uh you know, the guts of 50% on, on, on lots of farms. Nationally, cow numbers increased by over 50%. Milk solids output um, increased pretty dramatically over that period of time as well. So, so you have the combination of both productivity gain and increased cow numbers. And I suppose at the same time, you have more land entering into dairy over that period. Obviously, that's uh, a very good situation, I suppose. But there, like you said, we do get stuck in the moment and it was something I've been trying to make clear to people as well is that we have a good story to tell. And even though we have challenges to overcome, we're coming from a very good base in the first place, like despite what the media might have out there about this and that. But like what lessons have we learned, I suppose, from the last 10 years in terms of the expansion phase? Like, And I suppose you mentioned it there as well. The other question, I suppose, uh, that I'd have for you, and you can take them separately if you want to. But the the build you talked about the built up capacity in the industry as well. There is there a bit of a challenge coming in terms of people that were absolutely bursting waiting for quotas to be removed have done the ten years now, and because of the age that they were maybe at, in 2015, they're getting to the point of where they're nearly beginning to to finish up their career in dairy farming almost, and like. They they really enjoyed the last ten years, but they've just gotten to that point where they're they're looking for the next uh, person to come in, basically. So, is that a challenge for us going forward? Absolutely, no. I, and I suppose take your first question first, like you know, and go back to the last uh, ten years. I suppose up to twenty twenty, we could say. Uh, cost production at farm level had remained pretty static over that period of time, you know. Um, so we had all this uh, expansion, but cost production had held pretty solid. But since then, we've seen pretty dramatic increases in costs. Like I was looking recently at CSO data, and it showed a fifty percent increase in the input price, you know, I- input price index, which is absolutely huge. Now that was in twenty twenty two, and it dropped to something close to low forties in twenty twenty three, and has dropped again in uh, twenty twenty four. So we should see cost drop uh, based on that. Now, we we sometimes, I suppose, you know, we are a pasture-based system, so weather has a pretty big effect on our on our system. So, you know, cost of production increased by 50% uh, at farm level over the last uh, three to four years. Uh, some of that was inflation-driven. Some of it is to do with uh, weather events. And some of it is to do with maybe a little bit of a slippage in terms of um, less pasture in the system and more bought-in feed. So there's things there that we need to work on to make sure that we keep this uh, overall business sustainable in the long term. That's the first point. Second point in terms of generation renewal. Absolutely, you know, if you think about an industry uh, um, pent up for 31 years uh, and then there's this growth. And and absolutely, there are... um, 
um, situations now where people are maybe looking to step back a little bit, very profitable businesses, very, um, you know, very good and strong potential earnings from those businesses. Um, but um, they're maybe maybe getting on a little bit and want to take a step back. So it's really important, I think, for uh, the industry and for all of us to work together to ensure that those younger people that are coming through the system that maybe want to take on those opportunities are empowered to take on those opportunities uh, and, and provide two things, provide a, a business opportunity for those younger people coming through the system. And secondly, provide a, a step back ne- mechanism for that farmer that has grown their business over that prolonged period of time. So that's probably, Stuart, one of our biggest priorities now today to ensure that those uh, kind of models are in place and can be utilized. And for me, for that younger person to be able to identify the right opportunity is is probably the most important part, that they're technically capable of of running these operations and that they're able to, you know, identify which one is best for them. Because, you know, not every opportunity is going to work for, for, for everyone. Okay, so I might just explore that one with you a little bit now because um, I suppose everyone will be familiar with kind of the share farming and the share milking type scenario coming from New Zealand. But the other question that arises with that though, is the scale there in an Irish context for that to happen? Um, or the would say, like there's often talk about the generational renewal options within Ireland relative to the likes of of the New Zealand scale. Is is it as feasible? Like, I would argue strongly that we're probably in a better situation uh, from an Irish context because the one thing that we don't have on mass on Irish dairy farms is debt. You know, there's relatively um, modest debt on most farms. You know, the average I think debt from the National Farm Survey is maybe uh, something like a thousand euros per cow, which is relatively small when we look at internationally. You know, we look at the Dutch and they're probably closer to 10,000 a cow. The Danes probably 20,000 euros a cow. And the the New Zealanders, eight or 9,000. So that that creates uh, an opportunity. I suppose that's the first thing. Yeah, scale is an issue in some situations, but I suppose if we look at some of the things that have happened in the last, again, five, six, seven years with the the leasing model, you know, scale is something that has been able, you know, for many farms, not for everyone, um, but for many farms, scale is something that they've been able to address through leasing onto their own platforms. And to be honest, if the uh, farm has been, you know, cost production are well under control and productivity and efficiency is good on the, you know, growing plenty of grass on, on the farm, you know, the returns are, are very strong in that lease model uh, once the things are done well. So I, I, you know, I'd be slightly less worried about the scale being the issue. I don't think it's going to be the biggest barrier, um, because we know now that there are things we can do around scale. Okay, so you mentioned something very important there in terms of that efficiency element of it. Like, so the the average hundred cow farm in Ireland, if it's very well run, you and I know from looking at figures that they can be very profitable. So there, there is scope there, but the 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 efficiencies have to be there. So I suppose. To deal with that main one that you've mentioned there in terms of the, the role of grass in driving that efficiency, like your objective now next week is to talk about growing 15 ton and there'll be people listening to us today asking, have we lost our marbles? Like it seems to be impossible to grow 15 ton with the last number of years. So I suppose there is there can there be a recency bias maybe in some of our thinking in that, yes, we definitely have had some challenging years with the last few years and like this year is actually as it currently stands is working out quite well we seem to be getting rain when we need it we're getting heat when we need it for the vast majority of the country there's some areas still getting pinched but um so that recency bias i suppose is is it throwing us off in terms of what we think we can potentially grow and then what are the challenges that we need to overcome to make sure that we can grow that again and do we really need to refocus on that piece of the jigsaw like for me, it's the most important uh, opportunity we have. It's the only, it's really the reality is, and we talk a lot, uh, but the reality is it's the only competitive advantage we have to be able to grow grass over a long grazing season and be able to graze it over the long grazing season. We don't have a Rotterdam for cheap grain. Uh, we're not sitting on the on the door of the market. So we don't have, you know, these inherent advantages. The one we have is we can generally grow grass for a long grazing season. We get a little bit excited and we've we've we're we're partial to it here ourselves in Moorpark, uh, Stuart, to be honest, about um climate and weather. And yeah, there are definitely there is change happening. Absolutely we have to we have to say that. 
And, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been, you know, some struggles over the um, summer period around growing grass over, or, you know, I'm slow to say drought, I would say restricted growth in, in, in situations. But there are other parts of the country that haven't been restricted. And just, you know, pull down, is it still possible to grow 15 tonnes? Well, it's harder to grow 15 tonnes now because you're going to have to do it with less, with less chemical nitrogen uh, in the system. Uh, but does that mean we can't do it? Absolutely not. And, you know, we look at pasture base and we look at the data regionally, you know, consistently enough, we have uh, a cohort of farmers in there that are growing very close to 15 and over 15 tonnes over on a, on a prolonged period of time. So, you know, you look at, um, take uh, Clannacilty and the studies that we're doing down there um, in 2024, uh, the Clan of Kilty, which wasn't a, an ideal, you know, by any st- stretch of imagination year for growing grass in 2024 20, with 150 kilos of nitrogen, uh, Clan of Kilty grow 15.5 tons of grass in that trial. So, so yes, it's more difficult now than it was for two reasons, less nutrients and, and the climate is having an impact. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that we have to, I suppose, work on it, you know, whether soil fertility is correct, like I think the stats are 17% of even dairy farms, which we say are technically technically strong in general, only 17% of those soils are optimum in terms of soil fertility. You're not going to grow 15 tons if you haven't optimal soil fertility. So there's lots of things we can do at farm level to increase that grass growth. Go back to your first point. You know, uh, the focus has to be on pasture. You know, if we lose that advantage and we're seeing that utilization increase by right roughly from six and a half tons, probably 10 years ago, uh, up to about 8.3, 8.4 tons uh, on average on the average dairy farmer. And um, that has uh, over the last two to three years has started, you know, going backwards slightly. And if we look at the proportion of bought in feed coming into the system, uh, that was running at, at, at you know, 80, you know, 17, 18%, and that's gone to 21, 22%. So for me, there are two important points. They are the two we have to go after to ensure that we stay, uh, you know, stay sustainable, stay efficient, stay ahead of the curve. Okay, so Lawrence, I suppose um, just to wrap it up then, in terms of the changes that we've seen since the last open day, uh, are there any other challenges outside of the the people piece? We'll say, and the um the the nitrogen, as you mentioned there, we'll say we have to live in a, a lower nitrogen regime. Are there any other challenges that we're going to have to be taken on, and how are we going to take them on? I suppose in terms of Chagas's view of it. So I suppose for me, if we just stand back and look at some of the stuff that um has been happening, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are are going the right direction. They went the right direction in 2023. They dropped, they're now 4.1% below where they were in 2018. Uh, that needs to continue, right? So we can't take our, 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 our leg off the gas there. And the key ones there have been around um, how, you know, the type of chemical fertilizer uh, and the levels of fertilizer as we get more technologies in. Obviously, things like DBI and age of slaughter and all those things are contributing. Um, but, you know, emissions are dropping. I would expect emissions will drop again in 2024. Um, so, you know, and the EPA will be out with those numbers relatively soon. So that's that's the first thing. Second thing is in terms of water and the um, really important for us, obviously, stock and rate is a key driver of uh, efficiency and productivity in a pasture-based setting. So, you know, the early indicators report from the EPA showed, you know, you know, significant reductions in nitrate concentrations in 2024 on, uh, I think it was on 20 of our, our, our main rivers. Uh, so that's positive. We need to see that continue. Uh, and again, there's lots of things we can do at farm level, whether it's around nutrient balance, uh, whether it's around manure storage, whether it's around soil water that need to be done, if we're being honest, um, at, at farm level. The third one and for me is, 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 is ammonia. And if we stand back and look at where we've gone in ammonia, we're now compliant. We've had significant reductions in ammonia. So, you know, I'm really positive about th- the things that can happen at farm level. You know, uh, if you're a farmer, you have, you know, maybe four or five years ago, we were, we were shouting that we need to reduce ammonia, but the uptake of low emission slurry spreading, the uptake of lower crude protein concentrate, the uptake of uh, protected urea has meant now we're, we're, we're in a good place from an ammonia point of view. We need to keep that momentum going with uh, the water and the greenhouse gases. And the last one, sure, just to kind of draw that one out, is in terms of dairy calf to beef, you know. It's, um, you know, if we look at it now and look at, uh, you know, I suppose if we're being really honest, 
the narrative in the, in, in the industry maybe three or four years ago was, you know, how do we manage the calves? Now we look at it as it's a huge opportunity. Dairy calf to beef is a huge opportunity and the uptake of sex semen by farmers, the uptake of high DBI genetics by farmers is just absolutely amazing. So, so the opportunities in that area are, are very big. So like if you, if you, if you look at all this together, you have a, a very strong story in terms of what can happen right across the industry in different places. Now we need to focus, as well as focusing on those areas, we need to focus on a number of other areas and, and cost of production, growing more grass, for me, are key to those. That's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Age podcast. And we send you all our very best wishes for a happy, healthy and safe 2026. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs, and join us next time for your Dairy Edge.